Praise the Lord. Before I hear the preach of God's word, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, as man shall not live by bread alone, but in every word which proceedeth out of thy mouth, we thank thee, O Lord, for giving us this day our daily bread. For as newborn babes we desire the sincere milk of thy word, whereby we may grow thereby. Pray, the Lord, this even sanctifies with thy truth, for thy word is truth, that thou wouldest even sanctify and cleanse us through the washing of the water of thy word, that we may be presented unto thee, O Lord, a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle with any such thing, to be holy and without blemish, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Once again, the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9 and verse 10. It is written in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9 and verse 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And again, many use these two verses of the scriptures as a formula in getting saved. Now, we do not use God's word and make formulas from the word of God. The word of God is what? 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23, be born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. God's word liveth. Therefore, you cannot make formulas from the word of God. And today, there's been a practice that started in the last century. This is a new practice if you study church history. Now, once again, I am a student of the early church. And I trace my spiritual lineage back to the church and do a lot of study on church history as a student of the early church. And this idea, this formula of a sinner's prayer is new in church history. It is started by a man by the name of Billy Sunday, who was your first prosperity preacher, who was also a Freemason, and who also is into a social gospel and not really the gospel of salvation. And this man, Billy Sunday, he made a formula that if you'd come forward and shake his hand, that you'd be saved. By shaking Billy Sunday's hand, you're making a confirmation. You're going to believe in Jesus and follow Jesus. And he gave the handshake as a sign of getting saved. And then, then put in a sinner's prayer with that based on Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and verse 10. We have found through experience and preaching the gospel for the past 26 years by the grace of God that most people who pray the sinner's prayer have yet to be born again. Most of them even confess that they are saved sinners. That's an oxymoron. Either you're saved or you're a sinner. You're not both. You can't be a... Well, how can you make an analogy of that? You can't be a saved sinner. Either you're saved and no longer sinning, or you're a sinner still in sin. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, what is written? And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name what? Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. Christ does not save us in our sins. How does Christ save us? By his death on the cross. And by his death on the cross, what does that do to us? 1 Peter chapter 2. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 24. Who, the Lord Jesus Christ, his own self, bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. If you're dead to sins, guess what you're no longer doing? Sinning. If you're still sinning, you're alive in sin. Therefore, the cross of Christ has had no effect upon you. 
Either you're saved or you're a sinner. Either you're dead to sin and living to righteousness, or you're living in sin and dead to righteousness. You can't have it both ways. Romans chapter 10. Therefore, through experience for the past 26 years, the majority of people that I've met who have based their salvation on praying a sinner's prayer, that they answered an altar call, they went to a church, they went to some meeting, they watched on TV, and they prayed a sinner's prayer, and they say that's when they got saved, the majority of them will confess that they are saved sinners and still in sin. They'll confess that they still continue to sin to this very day. What does that show to us? The sinner's prayer does not work. We have seen the fruit of it, and Christ says, By their fruits ye shall know them, and the fruits are evil, the fruits are wrong. Many years ago, I was invited to what they call the prison ministry in Thailand, because there was only one at that time. And praise God, they used to invite me to the worst prisons, the prisons that no missionaries and other preachers would go to, such as the prison there in Ayutthaya. And in that prison in Ayutthaya, the, you go into the first gate, and then the second gate, the warden says goodbye to you. That's it. They don't control after that. And then in the second gate, prisoners meet you. The prisoners are in charge of the prisons with homemade weapons escorting us to where they're having the preaching at. And that was a great place to preach the gospel. The majority of the prisoners in that prison have tattooed their faces. Why are they tattoo their face for? Because it shows the other prisoners they don't ever want to get out. Because if they get out with a tattooed face, they'll never get a job. They'll never have a future outside the prisons. By tattooing their face, their whole face, it shows they're lifers. They're in it for life. And if a person's going to be in prison for life, that means they don't care about killing inside prison. They're going to be, what are they going to do? Give them more time? They're in it for life. So when they tattoo their face, they're showing their lifers. They're in for life. And in that prison, many people have tattooed their faces. Even one man tattooed the back of his head. What did he tattoo the back of his head for? He tattooed the face of Osama bin Laden. What did he do that for? For protection so they would rape him. They didn't know they would have raped somebody with Osama bin Laden looking at them. He had Osama bin Laden's face tattooed in the back of his head for protection. These are rough and tough prisons I was preaching the gospel in. Praise God. Well, as I was preaching in these rough and tough prisons, then they invited me as the guest preacher on the big Christmas outreach at the biggest prison in Bangkok. And at this big outreach at the biggest prison in Bangkok, once a year, they bring in all this food, a certain noodle dish known as Kanom Chin, which is a mon dish, which is a religion called Kona Chin. And of course, the Burmese call it Mohinga. And then because the Thais borrowed it from the mon, they changed the name from Kona Chin to Kanom Chin. So they had this dish. And in the prison, they don't get to eat this dish. They don't get to choose. There's no cafeteria in there. This is a once-a-year deal. They get to eat these noodles known as kanom chin. But in order for the prisoner to eat the chin, they play a game. What's that game? They've got to pray the sinner's prayer. If they don't pray the sinner's prayer, they don't get the Christmas goodies, the gifts they bring in, or the kanom chin they're coveting. So, miracle miracles every year, the whole prison gets saved, except the year that I preach. I did not give any altar call or any sinner's prayer. They gave me 45 minutes to preach. I preached for 45 minutes of repentance and preached to them from the Word of God, the gospel of Christ. After that, they never invited me in there again because they put their faith in the sinner's prayer. Why? Because it brings in the money. Then they can write to their supporters every year how many souls, quote unquote, got saved. And then their supporters bring in that money because they're into the numbers, they're into the money. Again, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, verse 10, this is not a formula on how to be saved. This is something that you must do to confess the Lord with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart, what? That God hath raised him from the dead. What must you believe to be saved? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in this sinner's prayer that so many put their faith in, 
They never pray the resurrection. They pray his death. God, I believe Jesus died for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. Amen. They always believe in the death, but never the resurrection. What must you believe to be saved? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. What are the principles of the doctrine of Christ? That is the teachings of Christ found in the Gospels known as the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ... That should be your foundation as a Christian, the doctrine of Christ. For once again, in 2 John verse 9, If any man transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, he hath not God. What must we abide in to have God? The doctrine of Christ. What must be our foundation as a Christian? The doctrine, the teachings of Jesus Christ as they're found on the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance of dead works of faith toward God. To go into perfection is to move on from that. Verse 2, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. What is a doctrine that we're to go on to for perfection? The resurrection of of the dead. Once again, to be saved, you must believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. What must you believe in your heart to be saved? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is an important doctrine, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Back when I was first born again, the Lord led me to a church that was actually a house converted into a church on the outskirts of Bangkok in an area called Minbury. And on the Lord's Day, as I would take the bus there and the bus back, because on the outskirts of Bangkok, the bus very rarely came. <laughs> You'd have to wait for a long time. You remember that? Taking the buses there and back. There was what in the bus that went there all the time. And to get back into the city, it didn't come all the time. So in the afternoon, late afternoon time, because... When we assemble ourselves together, we don't just go and preach and leave. No, we got to fellowship together. It's very important to spend time with the brethren. And many a times, though I may be invited to preach from the pulpit of churches, we're much more of a blessing outside the pulpit with people one-on-one. -on -one. That's where the blessing is. Behold how good a blessing is for brethren to dwell together in unity. If there's ever a preacher comes to church, preaches, and leaves, that is a hypocrite. That is not an example of the believers. That is not a doer of God's word. That is not a person sent by the Lord. A preacher of God's word, we believe, must be the first one in church and the last to leave. Because if you're preaching from the pulpit, you've got to live it. And in order for people to see you living it, you need to spend time with them. And on there, the Lord's Day, when there's no COVID-19 restrictions, and we fellowship with the brethren, we're much more of a blessing out of the pulpit than we are in the pulpit. Therefore, it's so important to spend time with the brethren. And praise God, church service is an all-day affair. And when I was first born again back in 1995, as I was leaving the church, one of the last to leave, walking to the bus stop, knowing he's going to wait for about an hour or two for the bus came, as I was walking, the pastor of the church drove by in his car. His wife was driving him. He was in a Mercedes Benz. I paid it no mind. I didn't care that he picked me up. I was just happy, blessed on the Lord's Day, and going to catch my bus. 
So because I didn't get upset or jealous he's driving Mercedes or why didn't he give me a ride, and I didn't care anything, and he waved at me, I waved back at him, I got blessed. How did I get blessed? Because when he drove by me, he had in the back window of his car, people used to put slogans in the back, I guess they still do it today, they used to put slogans in the back window of the car, and he had in the English tongue, Jesus lives in me. Those words were more of a blessing that Lord said to me than this sermon, the preach of the pulpit. Those words were more of a blessing to me on that Lord's Day than the singing and the worship or anything else happened on that Lord's Day. Those words bless me. Jesus lives in me. There's a difference with Christians who focus on the death of Jesus. Oh, he died for my sins. My sins are under the blood. And then they sin and come back with the blood, the blood, under the blood. They sin all the death. And all they do is focus on the death. And what do they do? Just in and out of sin all the time. But a Christian whose faith and focus is on the resurrection, he lives it. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. What is in us? Resurrection power. The same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead. And in the English tongue, what do we call a spirit that comes back from the dead? A ghost. The Holy Ghost. The same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead, we have received. We can be born of the Holy Ghost. We can be temples of the Holy Ghost. We can be led by the Holy Ghost. We can live by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is living within us resurrection power. That though we're dead to sin, we're living unto righteousness. We're not focusing on our sins and getting our sins covered and how many sins we were focused on living it. We're so focused on living it that we don't have time to sin. We're so folk alive unto righteousness that we don't have time to do any kind of sin. Because if you're living unto righteousness, you're going to be dead to sin. And if you're living to sin, you're dead to righteousness. And by the resurrection power, by the Holy Ghost that is in us, we can live unto righteousness. That as we walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the spirit and the flesh lusteth one against another. So we walk in the spirit, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You walk in the flesh, you're not walking in the spirit. You've got to choose which one. And praise God, we have that resurrection power within us. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. What do we believe in to be saved? That God raised up Jesus from the dead. What kind of power we have in us? The same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead, the Holy Ghost, dwells in us. What are we born again by? By the Spirit of God. For that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The Holy Ghost. As the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what we believe in to be saved, this is why the Great Commission is so important to us. Because in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, when Christ rose from the dead, he gave to his disciples this commandment, which is the Great Commission. What was the commission he gave to his disciples? And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and he, the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead, he said unto them, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And praise God, as he that preaches the gospel should live with the gospel. For the past 26 years, by the grace of God, I've been living of the gospel and preaching the gospel to every creature. This verse of scripture is very important to us because it's by this verse of scripture, we live. This is what I do. Preach the gospel to every creature. Praise the Lord. But as important as this verse of scripture is, even more important is verse 15, Christ rebuked them and upbraided them after 
verse 14, after he, the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, appeared unto the eleven, and as they said at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief, hearts heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So more important than preaching the gospel is not having unbelief or hardness of heart. More important than preaching the gospel is your heart. Where is your heart at? More important than preaching the gospel is belief. Do you have faith? For without faith, it is impossible to please God. So in order to preach the gospel, you must first have faith, and your heart must be a heart filled with love. Because Christ, before he gave the eleven this great commission to go into the rich house of every creature, he first had to upbraid them or rebuke them because of their unbelief and hardness of heart. So we see that faith is more important than preaching the gospel, and the heart is more important than the preaching. Because God looks at your heart. And if your heart's not right with God, it doesn't matter how much gospel you preach, God will not bless it. That's why you see so many attempt to preach the gospel, and nothing happens. Nobody's getting bored again. No souls are getting saved, because God's looking at their heart. For God seeth not as man seeth. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. First Samuel chapter... First Samuel chapter, I believe, 17. Oh, no. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. That's the 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. Verse 7 is first Samuel chapter 16. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For a man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So more important than preaching the gospel is, where is your heart? More important than preaching the gospel is, do you have faith or not? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Once again, that is written in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. For without, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For you that come unto God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. More important than preaching the gospel is faith and where your heart is. More important than that is John chapter 20. Before Christ upbraided them for their unbelief and hearts of heart, before Christ gave to them his great commission to go into the world and preach the gospel of every creature, the first words that Christ spake to them when he arose from the dead, John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same that evening being the first day of the week, that was the first Lord's day. When the doors were shut for the disciples of the of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and what was his first word to them? And saith to them, Peace be unto you. More important than faith, more important than the heart, more important than the Great Commission is peace. Peace is the most important thing. Do you have peace? Why is it the most important thing before even faith? before even the heart issue, before even the Great Commission, why was this the first words that Christ spake to his disciples? Peace be unto you. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of what? but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. God is the author of peace. If there's no peace in a church, God's not there. And how many churches today is filled with confusion? What kind of confusion? Women in leadership, that's confusion. That's what the Bible rebukes, because the following verse says, Verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches. 
Now, it's not a coincidence these are together. Because when the women are not silent in the churches, guess what you don't have? You don't have peace. There's lots of confusion when women are not silent in the churches, especially when women are taking over leadership roles. Guess what you don't have? No peace. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Therefore, let your women be silent in the churches, for it is not prevent them then to speak, for they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now, there used to be a group of Christians here in Bangkok. There were an international group. You had Japanese, you had Filipinos and Filipinas, you had Thais, you had New Zealanders, you had all Australians, you had a whole group of Americans, a mixed multitude of Christians from different churches, different denominations, and they would meet together because they had a desire to reach the many Jews here in Bangkok with the gospel. Now, of course, none of these in this group preach to the many Jews that are in Bangkok at the time. But they used to like to meet together and talk about it, pray about it, and sing about it, and teach about it. And so they invited me to their meeting, and they were very excited because, praise God, by the grace of God, and only by the grace of God, I've been preaching the Jews here in Bangkok, Thailand, since 1998, until the restrictions of COVID-19. Until that time, we have been faithfully preaching the gospel to the many Jews here in Bangkok, Thailand. Every year, hundreds of thousands of Israelis used to visit Thailand. And they used to all come to Bangkok first and then go to different parts of Thailand. But they always used to go here at Khao San Road, and that's when we began preaching the gospel back in 1998 on Khao San Road to the Jews. Praise the Lord. Well, this group in the 2000s, I guess 2005, 2006, they had heard of me. They invited me to join them. They had this desire to preach the Jews. And as they would teach about it and talk about it, pray about it, I rebuked them for doing nothing about it. And they got very offended by that. And the women in leadership, women in leadership of this group, they got offended that I was rebuking them for not preaching to the Jews, just only talking about, seeing about, and praying about it. And so then as she tried to take authority and tried to correct me, I had to rebuke her for trying to use of authority over the man. Well, in this group, they went ballistic because the women in this group were all in authority. And one of the women was a Filipina. And she wrote me this email with all kinds of words, all capital letters, no punctuation. I had no idea what it meant. So I had her husband's email, who was a Japanese man, and I forwarded the email to her husband and asked him, could he interpret what his wife is trying to say? I had no idea what she was saying. I mean, there was no punctuation. It was all in capital letters. It was stuff about in Christ, no male, female, and I'm this. I'm, it just went crazy. And I asked him, honestly, could he interpret this for me? He never emailed me back. Why? He couldn't even interpret what his wife was saying. You see... That's not peace, that's confusion. God is not the author of confusion, but a peace in all the churches. If there's no peace in the church, God is not there. First Thessalonians chapter five. First Thessalonians chapter five, it is written. Verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and Bibles are blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The very God of peace. Who is our God? He is the very God of peace. He is not just the God of peace. He is the very God of peace. That should say something to us that the apostle writing this under the inspiration of the ghost would write this about God, that he's not just the God of peace, he is the very God of peace. That's how important peace is. God is the author of peace in the churches. Therefore, let's look at the greetings of the apostle Paul. Let's begin here in the book of 
Romans. Verse 7. When he writes these epistles, and this was Ghost, the apostle Paul writes these words. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Romans chapter 1, verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be in saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, grace is important. By grace we're saved through faith. Of course, grace is important. If we have gifts different than the grace is given to us. Of course, grace is important. It's quite the grace of God we can labor and serve the Lord. But just as important as grace is, so is peace. When the apostle wrote this epistle, and this special ghost, he writes, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 2 and verse 3. Unto the church of God, to the Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, just as important as grace is, so is peace. And we can continue you know, with all the epistles. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, writing to the same church, his second epistle, written official Ghost, in verse 2, the apostle writes, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We can move on now to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Once again, verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 2. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And again in Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 2, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes into Colossians chapter 1 once again. Verse 2, to the saints and faithful brethren of Christ, which are Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then move on and on now to the First Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And again in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in every one of these epistles, written as official ghosts, the apostle writes, peace be unto you. When Christ rose from the dead, and this resurrection is important to us. It's so important to us, we base our life on the commission he gave to his church when he rose from the dead to go to the Lord and preach God's every creature. The first words that he said to the disciples were, Peace be unto you. Peace is that important. For God is not the author of confusion, but a peace as in all the churches of the saints. For God is the very God of peace. Therefore, peace is important. And how can we get this peace? Philippians chapter 2. This peace the apostle is praying for all the churches to have. To have grace and peace. Sorry about that. Philippians chapter 4. This peace that Christ said to his disciples when he rose from the dead, peace be unto you. How can we have this peace? Verse 6 of Philippians chapter 4. Be careful for nothing. That's how you can have this peace. But everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the God of peace. Then the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. How can we have this peace? 
the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, verse 6, by doing something first, by being careful for nothing. If you're filled with the cares of this world, if you have cares of this world in you, if you are careful, full of care, full of worry, full of cares of this world, you will not have this peace. And how is it we be careful for nothing? Verse 6, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And what's the benefit of that? And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Our prayers make a difference. But Brother Tony, you've been praying for your neighbors for over a year, and now they haven't got saved yet. Brother Tony, you've been praying for your unsaved relatives, and they're not yet saved yet. Brother Tony, you've been praying for this and praying for that, and it, nothing's happened yet. No, prayer changes things. You know what changes? The prayer person. Yes. When you're praying for these things and everything, and you're laying your quest before God with thanksgiving, guess who it changes? It changes the person that is praying. What does it give to us? Peace. The peace of God which passeth all understanding. Yes, as we pray for others to be saved. Yes, as we pray for revival to break forth. Yes, as we pray for the impossibly done, and though by sight things may not happen right away, it may take time as we pray, it changes things. Do you know what it changes? It changes the person that is praying, that you can have peace. Yes, there's unsaved relatives who are anti-Christian and who will do anything they can to stop us from preaching the gospel. Yes, there's neighbors that take us as enemies for preaching the gospel. They will do anything they could to do anything contrary to us. But we can have peace no matter what they do because we pray for them. We pray in everything. We lay our request before God with thanksgiving. And what happens? Those prayers change us. It gives to us peace. A peace that passeth all understanding. The peace of God coming from the very God of peace. The God who is the author of peace. When we pray in everything and we're careful for nothing, those prayers change things. It changes us. It gives to us peace. Christ says in John chapter 16, verse 33, In this world ye shall have tribulation. And what does Christ liken tribulation in this world to? Storms. In this world, you're going to face storms. But we see the example in Mark chapter 4, what happens when you have Christ with you. When the Lord is with you, what happens? Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. And the same day when the evil is come, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, saith unto them, his disciples, let us pass over into the other side. Why are they going to the other side for? Because the Lord said so. Why are they doing this work? They're obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. Just because you obey the Lord and do what the Lord says, it does not keep you from tribulation. In fact, when you do what the Lord says, it will cause tribulation to happen to you. Just because you're following the Lord, it does not mean you're not going to face storms in life. And how many professing Christians give up because they want to come to Jesus for an easy life? They want to come to Jesus to have a life of ease and comfort. And when they follow the Lord and it leads to hardships, trials, and tribulations, they give up and they quit. They want the easy way. They want the comfortable way. They don't want to follow the Lord. How many are not following the Lord today that profess to be Christians? How many are outside the will of God today that profess to be Christians because they don't want to go the way of the Lord? That's too hard. No. They want to go the easy way. 
They don't want to go through the way of storms. They want to go around the storms. They want to avoid the storms. They want to have a life that is void of trials and tribulations, a life of ease and comfort. Sadly, a man my age who gave me the gospel booklet that I was born again by became false. And today, he is a false teacher and a false prophet. And I saw when he began going false. He wanted to make some money with a book. And as he made this book and was trying to make money with this book, he began trying to promote that book. And so the, one of the last times he met us, I think it was the second the last time he met us, or maybe been the last time he met us, in person, he was trying to sell this book to us. He had written a book and didn't give it to us for free. He wanted to sell it to us, and we weren't interested in it. So he was spending his time trying to advertise this book to us to sell it to us. And one of his advertisements to it was he had joined me as I went to preach the gospel, he and a friend of his. And as we're on our way to the Middle East Street, we're going to eat something first. Walking down Sukhumet Soy 3, a big shot who thought he was a mafia man. I guess he was a mafia guy. Had all the idols around his neck, big old guy. And as we're walking by, and he said to me in the Thai tongue, you're dead. I'm going to have you killed. You keep it up and you keep your big mouth here preaching. I'm going to have you killed. So I stopped and get in front of that man. I said, well, let's do it now. Why not do it now? Why, why talk about it? Why don't you do something about it now? I'm ready to die for the gospel and begin preaching. I'm born again. I'm on my way to heaven. Anytime I welcome your threats, I will not fight back. I'm on my way to heaven and begin preaching to them. But that young man and his friend, though they're wearing slippers, what they call flip-flops, went flip-flopping down the road running. They literally ran away. And I'm preaching this big shot mafia guy and letting them know I'm not afraid to die. Praise God, I'm on my way to heaven. Praise the Lord, I welcome death. It is a blessing to die for the gospel. Preach the gospel. These two men ran away, flip-flopping down the roads. They were in slippers, little flip-flops, and ran away. And so I had to leave this guy, this mafia guy, and follow these two. And we got to the place, sit down to where we're going to eat at. And he was very silent, the young man, the man my age. And then he said to me, trying to advertise a book to me, he said, I've been preaching the gospel way where I never have that happen to me. They never threatened my life. And he was going to tell me his tactics in this book. If you buy his book, well, let him know where there's no ox, the stall is clean. Where there's no persecution, the gospel's not preached. If you're preaching the gospel, especially in a heathen country with heathens who reject Jesus for idols, who reject Jesus for the worship of devils and spirits, they're going to do like they do in a filthy evangelist preach. They're going to cry out in a rage against you. And if you're preaching the gospel in a place of this and they're not crying out in a rage, you're doing nothing. <laughs> if you're preaching the gospel here, they're going to cry out. They're going to come against you. You're going to be persecuted. As the Bible says, Yea, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Christ says that you're blessed when they persecute you, not if, when they persecute you. And if a person professes to preach the gospel and they're not being persecuted when they're preaching the gospel, something is wrong with them. So this man trying to offer this book to me, trying to offer that he has the way to preach because of Buddhists where they won't persecute you, that just completely turned me off from him. And then to see where his downfall began. He wanted to serve the Lord in a way that he wouldn't get persecuted or face any hardship. And that's what he's trying to sell the book for, get that money to live a nice, easy, comfortable life. Because to serve the Lord is not easy. Christ has promised us what? In John 60, verse 33, in this world ye shall have tribulation, especially if you're following the Lord. Hold your finger here, Mark chapter 4, and turn with me to John chapter 16, verse 33. What does Christ promise us in this world? These things are spoken to you, that in me ye might have peace, and the world ye shall have tribulation. Be a good cheer, overcome the world, and Christ 
there is peace by the words he speaks to us. Praise God for the words of the Lord. We have peace. But in the world, we shall have tribulation. So in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, the Lord commanded his disciples, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there also with him, there also with him other little ships. Verse 37. And there rose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat in the ship, so that it was now full. Verse 38. And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, was in the hinder for the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they wake him and say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Verse 39. And he, the Lord, arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there's a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? In the storms of life, we can have peace. How? How we have this peace of God that passes all understanding? By letting our request be made known unto God. And God answers our prayer. He gives the peace to us. That in the midst of the storm, we can have peace. By who? By the Lord. He can speak peace to our situation. Not us. The Lord does. How many false Christians today take those verses of Scripture and think that means for them to speak to their problems. How many Christians today are trying to speak to the problems today? They think they have the same power Christ had. They call it authority. And they think that they can speak the word to the problems, and the problems will go away, and their problems never do. They think they have the power to speak to things, and things will go away, and it never happens. No. The disciples, that's who he follows. They follow Christ. They pray to the Lord. And the Lord spoke peace in the storm. And the Bible says to have this peace that passes all their sinning, we are to be careful of nothing, but by let our request be made known unto God. We don't speak to our problems. We don't speak peace into our situation. We pray to God. And God gives us his peace. The peace of God which passeth all understanding. John chapter 14, verse 13 and verse 14 that is written. In John chapter 14, verse 13 and verse 14, Christ says, And whatsoever we shall ask in my name. Who do we ask? That will I do that the Father may glorify the Son. We ask the Father. We don't pray to our problems. We pray to God. We pray to God the Father in the name of his Son, Jesus. And in verse 14, Christ says, If you just anything in my name, I will do it. Who does it? The Lord does it. Who do we pray to? We pray to God. We pray to God the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Lord does it. He speaks peace to the problems. He speaks peace to the storm. He gives us to us peace, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. This peace is important. If you don't have this peace, you cannot preach the gospel. For before Christ gave to them his great commission to go into the world and preach God's every creature, before he gave them that great commission, he first said to them, Peace be unto you. You need the peace of God to preach the gospel. The churches of God are called to be churches of what? Peace. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace in all the churches of the saints. And praise God, no matter where we live, as you've grown up in the gospel, and since you can remember, we've always assembled ourselves together wherever we live. And not coincidentally, everywhere we live, birds build nests wherever we live. Here in this building, 444 rooms, there have never built nests in any of the rooms here, except the rooms we live in when we're living there. And praise God, here in this room, how many sparrows are living with us right now? He said seven or eight. Eight sparrows are living with us right now at our balcony. Nowhere else. Only where we live. Why? 
because there's peace. A few weeks ago when a cat was running away, which room did a cat run to? It ran to our room and scratched at our door. Nobody else is to us. Why? Because there's peace here. And we're the only room that bats have come to live in as well. We don't appreciate that. That's why we got screens up now to protect us from those dangerous bats. But we've had bats come and sleep with us as well too because there is peace. Praise God, we worship the Lord as we're doing. So for the past 26 years, we don't use the modern music where they beat on drums, beat on a bunch of bangos, beat on a bunch of drums. No, we worship the Lord as the Bible says. And nowhere in the Bible, in the Old and New Testament, does it ever say beat a drum. That's not the way you worship God. That's how the heathens worship the devil. We don't bang on drums. We don't beat drums. We worship God the way God has commanded us to do. And as we do so, God's creation worships with us as well. Babies don't cry and scream. They can worship the Lord with us as well. And many times people have been amazed when our children were just little babies. They weren't crying and screaming in church. They were worshiping God as well because we worship the Lord with the hymns. And we see the way God has commanded us to see it with melody. Making melody in our heart, singing unto the Lord. And as we worship the way the Bible commands us worship, it brings peace. Because God has called the churches to be churches of peace. When the apostle greeted the churches and the special Holy Ghost, he prayed that have grace and peace from God the Father, who is the very God of peace, and his son, Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. You need that peace. Just like we need the grace of God to serve the Lord, as I preached about in many previous sermons, so must we need peace the peace of God. And how do we get this peace that passes all understanding? By being careful for nothing, but let our requests be made known to God in everything with thanksgiving. Galatians chapter 5. In the book of Galatians chapter 5, it is written, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit, please take notice in the pure words which the Lord has preserved for us here today in the authorized version of the Holy Bible, the word fruit is singular here. There's not fruits with an S. It is only one fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And when there's the fruit of the Spirit is love, then there is joy. You can't have joy without love. How many professing Christians don't have joy because they don't have love? When they may worship the Lord, may they be close to God, they're about to be happy and joyful, then they think, so-and-so said that about me. And so-and-so did this. And so-and-so did that. And they don't forget what happens. It robs them of their joy. Without love, there's no joy. To have joy, you must first have love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. You can't have peace without first love and joy. If you're not forgiving others, it will rob you of joy and it will rob you of peace. There are professing Christians today, though the Bible says, God give it this beloved sleep. They can't sleep at nights because they're so worried about who said what, and he said this, and they said that, and they're so full of unforgiveness that they can't even sleep at nights because they have no peace. There's professing Christians today, they're checking themselves into mental asylums and taking mental medication because they have no peace because there's no love. And when you don't have love, you don't have joy. If you don't have joy, you don't have peace. A happy Christian is a joyful Christian. And you're going to be a happy Christian if you're walking in love. If you're not walking in love, you'll not have joy. If you don't have joy, you won't have peace. And then when there's that peace, you have long-suffering. 
There is no long suffering without peace. And that's why it's so important to have peace before we preach the gospel. Because it takes long suffering. To preach the gospel of Christ takes long suffering. That's why you need peace first. If you don't have peace, you don't have long suffering. And how many friends and Christians quit and give up? They don't have long suffering. They cannot endure to the end, though Christ says, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. They quit, they give up, because they don't have peace. When they have peace, they don't have joy. When they have joy, they don't have love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness. Now, without love, there's no joy, there's no peace, there's long suffering, then there's no gentleness. You can't have gentleness without long-suffering. You can't have long-suffering without peace. You can't have peace without joy. You can't have joy without love. And when there's gentleness, then there is goodness. And when there's goodness, then there's faith. And there's faith, there is in meekness, and then temperance. Notice it says temperance and not self-control. Self-control is all about you. That's not a fruit of the Spirit. Self-control is you controlling yourself. That's not a fruit of the Spirit. That's you. Self-control is you controlling yourself. Back when we preach in the Philippines, they invited us to at a Christian hotel, and they had Wi-Fi, so he had asked them for the password for the Wi-Fi. And the password was self-control. I laughed. I guess they thought that there's professing Christians doing some bad stuff online, so they made the password self-control. That means there's a lot of hypocrites. But we don't believe in self-control. That's you. If you got to control yourself, you're lost. You can't do it. But the fruit of the Spirit is temperance. That temperance comes from the Spirit of God. That temperance comes from first having meekness, having faith, having goodness, having gentleness, having long suffering, having peace, having joy, having love. It's one fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is all connected together. And against such, there is no law. Peace. Without that peace, you cannot preach the gospel. Without that peace, you, can, you cannot endure the trials and tribulations. Without that peace, you cannot make it in this world. And the longer we go in these end times, before the Lord returns, the harder it's going to get. That's why you got to assemble ourselves even more. Why we assemble ourselves together? The Bible says, not forsaking the assembly ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another as you see the day approaching. Why must we exhort one another to see the day approaching? Why must we assemble ourselves together often? Because it's going to get harder and harder in this work. The tribulations are going to get more and more in this world. What's going on right now is nothing compared to what is coming just around the corner. It's going to get a lot harder. And before that day comes, it's going to get much more harder, much more tribulations. Christ says you must endure to the end. In these last days, there's going to be a lot of things to endure. In this world, it's shall have tribulation. But in Christ, we can have peace. And if we would, in everything, let our request be made unto God with thanksgiving, we can have the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. When we walk in the Spirit with the fruit of the Spirit, one of that is peace, love, joy, peace. We can have this peace from the Lord that passeth all understanding. And when we have that peace that passeth all understanding, it attracts souls to us. That's why Christ said to them, peace be unto you, before he said, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When you can have peace in this world of storms, we can have peace in this world of tribulation, we can have peace in your trials, when you have this peace of God, which passeth all understanding, people will come to you wanting to get safe. People will come to you wanting to have what you've got. It is peace. And praise God, this God, the God of the Bible, this God who answers our prayer, this God who is the God, is the very God of peace. And as we're doers of God's word, with faith in God, praying to God, 
we can have his peace, which passeth all understandings. And his churches are not places of confusion. With women in leadership and confusion, his churches are churches of peace. For God is the very God of peace. And the peace that he gives us is the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. When Christ rose from the dead, his first words to his disciples were, Peace be unto you. And Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, he gives to us that peace that passeth all understanding. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee, O Lord, for thy word which endureth forever. And we pray, O God, that it be unto us according to thy word. Thank in thee, O God, for thy grace and thy peace which passeth all understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.